everyone, welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Rowe, Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual. We're going to peel back all the Lions' big stories, including the status of the tour, Marcus Smith's call-up, and Alwyn Jones' potential flying out to rejoin the squad in South Africa. Plus, Lazarus. we've got England fullback Freddie Stewart on the show as well. And if you're on TikTok, make sure you check us out. We've got a brand new Rugby Pod account on there as well. And don't forget to make sure you've subscribed to us on Spotify. How's your week been, boys? England tattoo on display on Sunday night, Jim? Absolutely. Uh, it wasn't. It was an English tulip. Let's get that out there <laughs> to the public domain and to the millions and the masses. A bit dusty today, but a good dusty because an air of normality. And I say that having shared a beer or 50 responsibly over Sunday. It was a long day. Let's be honest. It was a long build, up, wasn't it, to an eight o'clock kickoff. And I thought I was hanging. And then I saw the stuff on social media in the build-up. And I saw arguably one of the smallest woolies on a fully grown man I've ever seen doing the rounds on social media. And I felt better. I don't know what it was, but seeing that made me feel better. I showed back and said, this is what real life is like in the public domain, Rebecca. You've been locked up with me for 18 months. But this is what people look like in the real world, Beck. So you're welcome. You should be pleased with how things are going at home. Uh, and I'm going on holiday with the last for a couple of weeks. I put that in there as well. But I was supporting wholeheartedly, fully fledged quarter Englishman. I was supporting England, of course I was. And people are calling me out for it on social. Why are people calling me out on social for supporting my beloved England? But that's the thing, Jim, isn't it? So there's a lot of Scottish people that hate the English. I don't know why. The English fans are bothered about the Scots, but every Scotsman would expect you to hate the English and not support them. So. Uh, I'm surprised you're expecting anything different. I'm multilingual, Andrew, as you know. <laughs> so across the board, and I support champions, although it didn't come home. Let's get so to you're the Italian right this week, then, are you? Well, I've had a pizza today. Yeah, of course, a celebration. Uh, put a song out on Instagram, of course. But let's talk a little bit about the football before we get into the rugby. Andrew, you're a kicker of a ball, or you certainly used to before your ankle was fused and you've had a gastric band. Tell me, would you score a pen or would you think you could score one? Would you take one? Because I'm telling you now, and humbly, I would tell you, I'll sit here and say, I'd probably fucking score. If I was in that <laughs> position, Jesus. the goal is so big. How do you miss? I'm joking, by the way. I would be cacking myself. Andrew, yeah. would you put yourself up having kicked a few penalties and conversions in your time? Well, take, it's, aside, it's not... take aside the, the fused ankle. If you were in your heyday, would you have the bollocks? And I've seen them. They are fair play to you. They are big. <laughs> would you take a pen? I think the big thing around it is, like, in my position, you'd have to because you're the kicker, right? So if you, you try to compare it to, um, you know, rugby, when we've seen a couple of shootouts, haven't we? You know, the, the famous one, Leicester Cardiff years ago, Jordan Crane knocks over the winner. He has a football background. But... Yeah, I mean, I, I, you feel for those guys because you're either an absolute hero or you're an absolute zero. And, and we've seen some of the abhorrent nature of social media off the back of missing penalties. But I just don't think anyone that hasn't done what those guys have done, put their hands up and, and in front of 80,000 people at Wembley Avenue was in there. There was about another 100,000 that tried to break in as well. Absolute scumbags. And then the millions watching it around the world. To put your hand up and say, I'm going for that. Fair play, massive nuts. Um, best penalty out of the lot was Harry Maguire's, who you're probably thinking is a Jim Hamilton in, of, of uh, you know football, you know, big, tall. You ain't thinking he's sticking it in the top right corner, are you? But it was the best oh, penalty well, out of the lot. As, as soon as he steps up, I thought, there's a bit of him in me. Yeah. Me but there's him. people like you, Jim, and the big issue, Jim, the people, there's people like you that are looking at that going, the goal's massive, I'll put my foot through it, and I'm definitely scoring. When you add everything, all the pressure, all the, um, the eyes on you, the understanding of the nature of it, winning our first, potentially winning our first trophy for 55 years and everything that comes with it. And these kids, Sancho and Saka, they're like 17 and 19 years of age. You, know, you think back to when we were 17 and 19 years of age. You, you can wipe, mate, you can wipe your ass. And I, you know, I didn't have a, I was wet behind the ears as well. So um, would I put my hand up? Of course I would, because that's all I could do is kick a goal. I couldn't do my chance on the rugby field. Um, do I think I could score it? Probably not. But I'm honest, I'll probably blaze it over the bar, Chris Waddle stuff. Well, let's talk about the rugby now then and start with the British and Irish Lions tour. The Lions have played the Sharks twice since the last podcast after positive COVID tests meant that they couldn't face the Bulls. 
There have been over 20 cases in the Springbok camp and their game against Georgia was cancelled. Sir Khaleesi is among the latest to test positive just two weeks before the first test. And there are political riots in some of the cities with the military being deployed and people killed on the streets. It's not a pretty picture, is it, lads? No, it's not looking pretty. And you don't want to be too negative about it. And you don't want to compare the hysteria of the Euros. You don't want to compare the lead up to the Lions being so good to what we've seen now. I feel for them. You know, listen to Warren Gatland talking about how difficult a week it's been, them not knowing who they were going to play Wednesday. We know they're playing South Africa A, which looks like it's going to be class. You mentioned there, Andy Rowe, 20 cases plus in the South Africa camp, mixed between players and coaches. Sia Khaleesi, the captain, uh, the fact that they've had one game against Georgia, which, speaking to John Smith last week, was just a bit of a training run for them. Uh, the fact that their coach is self-isolating, Razi Erasmus is coming back into coach the team, which is obviously OK. Uh, I'm sure they'll get through that. But it's a worry. Now, this is the thing. I mean, looking at how COVID acts and what we know from over here and what we've seen through other teams, it's just, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how we're going to see a conclusion of this tour. And there's other stuff that's come out today, and I think we can chat about the game against the uh, the Sharks and and how well fronted up they were, especially for the first half. But it's I don't know, like it's just such an unknown. The next few weeks, we are less than two weeks away from the first test. This is the worrying thing, good, is it? We're two weeks away from the first test, and I tell you what, up until today, when I saw the team announced for South Africa, a, I weren't that interested. But now I've seen that team that they're going to put out. I'm thinking, actually, as Razi Erasmus said, if they're in an even tighter bubble than they were, I thought they were in the tightest bubble possible in the league anyway. But Razi said they're in the tightest of tightest bubbles. We know the Lions are in a tight bubble. And Gregor Townsend, I presume, is the coach with COVID because he's not been at the matches. I don't know if it's been confirmed. I don't want to say someone's got COVID when they haven't. But I'm putting five and five to go together and getting 69 and I'm thinking it's Gregor so I mean Goody I don't know what you think about it I watched that game against the Sharks and I'm just like what is this all about but I'll just reiterate the excitement me juices however sticky they might be and smelly they might be I'm excited now having seen this test match that's going to go ahead if it is a test match whatever you want to call it the match the midweek match on Wednesday against South Africa A but it's, it's not looking pretty at the minute. I just hope that everyone's okay. And you mentioned the lay of the land in South Africa. It's gnarly. It doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. And we need a spike of energy or adrenaline. And this Wednesday's match might be exactly what we need. Yeah, I think that's the big thing. You know, it must be incredibly difficult for all the players, the coaches, um, to, to live how they're living at the minute with so much uncertainty. And then there's, you know, I did a piece for Rugby Pass last week saying, move heaven and earth just to bring the test match series back to the UK and play it somewhere, you know, Twickenham's free, whatever. Logistically, obviously, there's going to be loads of issues around it, but you've got to credit everyone involved with the Lions, the players, uh, the management, the coaches, they've got a plan. And at some point, you've got to kind of question, is that the right way to go about your business? Just trying to get the test matches done in Cape Town behind closed doors, um, you know, with not only the the issue around the pandemic and, and COVID ravaging through the country, but also the political issues that are there at the minute, which are, are fairly, fairly big um, as well. So, yeah, you can only praise the, all the management players for, for coping with what's been chucked at them. Um, and that counts for the South African players as well in, in their bubble with the amount of positive cases that are coming through. And like Jim said then, you know, this morning, England have lost the, the football yesterday. Uh, so you're a bit down, uh, you know, and then you're thinking about the Lions tour and there was a bit of negativity around the Lions tour at the weekend because it was playing the Sharks again and it was just shoehorning the fixture in there to, to to play a fixture and they played them three, four days before. And you kind of like down on that as well. But then, as Jim said, that's Africa A team. That ain't no A team, is it? That is, you know, I think there's something like 11 World Cup winners in the starting team. Um, you know, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal side, which is basically an unofficial fourth test. Um, so that's got the juices flowing again. That's what everyone's excited about because, you know, from outside of that Lions camp, we're all sat back here watching it going, it's not that great. Every game pre-test matches, they're going to put 50, 60, 70 points on them because, as we've said the last few weeks, the weakness of those um, South African provinces, the, 
you know, the fact that all the South African boys are in a massive squad in supposedly a tight bubble. Um, it's none of them are playing in the provincial games and it's behind closed doors. And, you know, you don't want to beat the same drum every week, but it has been pretty tepid up until this point. But the excitement's flown again now. We're seeing that South Africa A side, you know, the fact that Ed's best player against Maratoji, you know, you can pick out some of the heads to heads in that. You know, Fafta Clerk, I, I first saw the team, I was like, no way is that Fafta Clerk and those boys, they're not their first choice starters. And then you look through and it going, well, obviously what they're trying to do is, is use this as a warm-up game for themselves. And rightly so, they can do that to build into the test series. So, you know, it's still a massive shame that's behind closed doors when you see in the scenes that, you know, with the football um, and, you know, perhaps hindsight is very easy. Perhaps we should have flipped it to the UK and, you know, or even pushed it back a year. But again, all the issues that we've spoken about previously on the podcast around the World Cup the year after next and how that affects everything if you push the Lions tool back a year. Um, they just thought this was the best plan of action. And when this is the best plan of action, that's the decision taken. You've got to get behind it. And, you know, the the excitement is building again now, seeing that South Korea side coming up against the Lions on Wednesday. And, I, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait. Is this a massive administration blowout? Because it's not necessarily hindsight that we're looking at and saying that the tour could have or should have been played in the UK. People have been talking about this for months with everything that's going on in South Africa. Do you think there should have been a plan B? There should have been a plan to actually move it to the UK last minute and have fans? It seems to me there's been a bit of denial down in South Africa. And again, something we spoke about last week and I mentioned it, whoever I've spoken to personally, whoever we've spoken to on the podcast, the media narrative around it is that I don't know if they were taking it as seriously as us or it's a case of a timing thing where the the wave has come at the worst time, the third wave. uh, And obviously we know that we're coming out of it now, whatever coming out of it means in terms of being vaccinated or in terms of just getting on with it because we have to. And the, the timing of this just doesn't fit, does it? It just doesn't work. So again, like Goody says, it's easy to say in hindsight, but there's absolutely no doubt about it. It is, an, it is a significantly diluted brand series, both from a Lions perspective and a South Africa perspective. The enjoyment that both the teams will get out of it is significantly diluted. The experience, I'm sure, is still very good. Like, you know, you see the joy of the Lions players wearing the red jersey, you know, when they're scoring tries and some of the performances that we've seen. But ultimately the vulgarities of it and the vulgarities of sport and life is money, clearly. Because if you're looking at it now and saying, right, should this tour be played right here, right now? The answer is no. Yeah, it is absolutely, definitely. no, it shouldn't be played. Of mm. course it should. It should either be delayed. It should either be delayed to next year. However the international calendar looks, I'm saying what it should do. I'm not thinking about the inter. I'm just saying what I think. Or it should be postponed and brought to the UK, like Goody said, where the fully vaccinated, which is obviously the narrative that's being spun now, a fully vaccinated South Africa squad against a fully vaccinated Lions squad and COVID not spoken about. Or it should be canned. Like, and I hate saying that. You're looking at it now, you're like, how and why is it being played? And we don't want to be too down on it. I'm working in and around it. I've got loads of stuff, activations myself, working. Um, to talk it up and talk the series up. And I'm sure after the game on Wednesday, if more South Africans have a clean bill of health, there's no more COVID cases and we get to see a test series in less than two weeks' time, it could all change. But if you're asking right here, right now, should we see this unfold? The the answer is clear for everyone to see. It shouldn't be happening. But it is because of the money, the sponsors, whoever's controlling that, you know, Sky Sports, the money that they've got, Super Sports, the headline sponsors, the partners, there's so many different layers that I don't think it's as simple as we know as moving it to next year or delaying it two or three months and bringing it over here. So I think we've got to try and find the positives out of what's in front of us. It changes every day. You know, I saw Warren Gatlin's interview just to go back to it. You can see he's just like, I don't know. Razzie's asked if they can play another game against South Africa right at the weekend. So you play on a Wednesday and a Saturday. Gats has said no, it's just like, who knows? And to go into a tour as the world champions, to go in the tour as the British and Irish Lions, to go into one of the highest profile tournaments, which is the British and Irish Lions series, saying we don't really know, 
is obviously part of the times that we're in, but also makes you question then why. Looking at what's been going on on the field, the two games against the Sharks, in terms of test selection, do you think we've learned anything? All I'm thinking, Andrew, looking at that, is how good some of the backs are. And again, going back to the conversation with John Smith last week, they're thinking about the forwards. Yeah. And the issue that you have against, no disrespect to the Sharks, well, maybe it's disrespectful. Um, there hasn't been a test up front, really, has there, around scrub and around line-out, just naturally, just because of the quality of opposition, and especially at the top, top end of world-class, you need to be tested, and they haven't really. So I think the headlines out of that Sharks game, especially the second one, was the back three, how are you going to choose that between Duane van der Merwe, Anthony Watson, who were both incredible again at the weekend, Liam Williams, Josh Adams, with what he's doing, Lewis Rees is going to get a shot again this Wednesday. But I think we will know more after this Wednesday, because you look at that South Africa A team, kits off, get your kit off. You know, you've got Evan Elizabeth, Mostart, two guys that could, would, might, probably will start for the Springboks. You know, Peter Steph Toy and Jasper Visa. Now you're going to get a proper test. You've got Mark, a test. You're going to get, you've got Malcolm Marks on the bench. You've got Vincent Cock. So now you've got a real test to see who, who's going to potentially play. So, would the Lions, this is the question, have changed their team if they knew that South Africa A were going to put this team out? Because really, how do you pick combinations when you're putting 60, 70 points on a team? I don't like how, when you're not really tested, you know, Chris Harris looked brilliant at 12 yeah. against a team you put 70 points on. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You scored, a hat trick against, you, mate, you scored a hat-trick against India, didn't you, Jim, back in the day? And, and if you're picking the day, so if you're picking a Lions tour... I haven't watched that game. I'm there. I'm captain. I'm probably the fucking coach as well. So <laughs> this is. It must be a. It must be. I reckon deep down, Gatlin's well happy seeing this because it's almost like from a South Africa perspective, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So yeah. if the Lions win, then there's going to be some sort of reverse psychology around that. If the Lions lose, it gets them up to the standard mentally of knowing in under two weeks' time, how hard it's going to really be. Because there was parts of that Sharks game where they were getting done physically. But again, as players, you've just put 60 points on the week before. Some of, you, some of them are backing up again. So, you know, they've got two or three days rest, which I don't think they should be doing anyway. I've always said that. I think seven days should be the bare minimum between a professional rugby match, especially at this level as well, on a Lions tour. So, um I think we'll know more at the weekend because I don't think the centres, Andrew, are... They know who they are. You know, Bundiaki, Chris Harris has now thrown himself into the mix. The back three, who knows? I think speaking to a few people, they think the front row is going to be set with Sutherland and Jamie George and, and Ty Furlong. I'm not too sure. Ian Henderson at the weekend with Mara Toji, you could arguably say they're maybe the front runners to start in that position. Falatau at eight. Hasn't played that well, but it's Falatau. So I think we're going to know more, and that's why I'm excited, like, like Goody said, about this game at the weekend, because not only is it going to be a stern test, the Lions could lose it, and I think that that's just going to add more fuel to the fire. Yeah, I mean, there's other chats around Niggles in the group as well. You know, Stuart Hogg hasn't played for a while now, has he? Um, he's obviously got some sort of niggle. You know, Anthony Watson was brilliant against the Sharks. He's now moving to fullback. Um, you know, Henshaw's out injured as well. We're waiting to see what happens to him. You know, Finn Russell, we'll see Marcus Smith get called up, which I, I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. Um, you, you know, so there's there's obviously a, a lot of little niggles in the background that are obviously Gats understands them all. They're not out in the press. They're not clearly being um, spoken about. Uh, but, you know, it's all sort of kept a little bit cloak and dagger at the minute, which is, which is fine because they're in a bubble and they've got to stay tight and they don't want to, release too much information but we're as pundits and as fans and everything that we all are we're trying to pick where we see combinations I think Bundyaki starts at 12 at the minute Connor Murray starts at 9 if you're looking along the back line bigger you know I think he starts at 10 at the minute um, it's interesting Farrell's not even on the bench on, on Wednesday um, you know are they trying to keep Farrell back for a test match now because Finn's out and Marcus Smith's going to fly in you know so many questions that we're all as fans and pundits trying to piece together um, Gats knows and I, you know I think you'll start to see you know, the combinations of 9, 10 and 12 this weekend. Um, uh, sorry, the combination of 9, 10 and 12 on Wednesday night, um, you know, could be the 9, 10 and 12. And for me, it's going to be the 9, 10 and 12 that starts the first test. 
Um, and then, like Jim said, picking the back three. Chris Harris has done exceptionally well, but everyone's waiting to see is Henshaw going to be fit because Henshaw was kind of nailed on to start in the Test Series. But Chris Harris is doing everything he can. Elliot Daly's come off the bench and covered at 13 at times and done very well as well. So, so many options without... And that's the problem. When you're hosing teams by 60, 70 points, everyone's putting their hand up in a different kind of way. Um, so, as Jim said, massive test, first real test, especially up front. Um, and there'll be a lot clearer picture after Wednesday night's game. We touched on it there, Goody. Marcus Smith being called up to the squad to cover Finn Russell, and the news broke while he was on the pitch for England against Canada. How'd you make of? Would you make of the the way he found out? Oh, mate, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, listen. When you're, and I've been part of these tours when the Lions series have gone on, and you're playing for England. You know, I was in Argentina one year. Um, I was in Canada another year um, for, for different Lions tours, and you sat there. Yeah, you know, one year I was on standby, uh, but for Marcus Smith. You're playing for England. And let's not forget, that's his second cap. So he's come off an unbelievable end of the season. You know, obviously, we've spoken about it on here, the comeback game in the semi-final, then they win the final. He's been instrumental in everything Quinns are excellent at over the last three or four months of the season. Fully deserved. You know, there's a lot of question marks coming out of Ireland. Why wasn't it Johnny Sexton? You know, surely he's next in line. But if you pick out a 10 that has done everything that's been asked of him over the last how many weeks, who's in form... You know, he's won the Premiership. He's then played for England. He's, you know, banging form for his club and country. And not just half-decent form, like proper top-end form, international-level form in his club team. Just remember, as much as I've got respect for Johnny Sexton, he hasn't played rugby since the middle of April, apparently. You know, that was one of his last games. So it's not even a question of, of thinking is Sexton in, in with a chance of getting picked because he hasn't played rugby for two months, at least two months, nearly three months, isn't it? So... You sat there thinking it's it's an it's actually quite I don't want to it's quite an obvious selection for me and Jim's spoken about it and I, I saw there were some messages on social media people saying Jim and Goody know because we've spoken about it on here haven't we that he's next in line and Jim's the oracle and if what Jim says goes and Marcus Smith you know he'd be buzzing to get out there who knows you never know he might kick the winner in the third test to win us the series behind closed doors but what a story you can make a movie out of that stuff couldn't you? Well, who knows? I know, and that's what exactly what he's going to do. It's, it was me chatting to my mentor over a glass of wine. He was with the British Irish Lions, so I was doing a quiz night for the British Irish Lions with some of their commercial sponsors. And Gas was getting my opinion on who was next in line. And I said, well, Goody was in the swimming pool with Johnny Sexton. Johnny Sexton said he hates me. It's Marcus Smith all day long. Because it's, <laughs> it's Harlequins till we die, Gas. Yeah. So he speaks really highly of him. I think it's what's interesting as well. Producer Tim was telling us that Eddie Jones knew the night before and didn't want to put it forward to him. Of course not. We heard as he was playing in the match, obviously uh, we saw on social media at half time, the commentators got wind of it a couple of minutes into the second half. Marcus Smith didn't know. So we're watching the team run against Canada and he's carving up. Of course he is. The whole of the England team are. They looked brilliant and they pull him off. And like we saw the scenes on social, that's what it's about, right? That's what dreams are made of. Like yeah. you're looking at that, I'm watching that and thinking, fair play to you, mate. You're a player that has put on a show all season, young lad, not been picked for England, arguably should have been picked for England in some kind of capacity. And you put in performances like that. Like you said, Goody, he's won the Prem. He's now got a second cap for England. Imagine how happy you will be. Imagine. And he spoke really well. He spoke with his heart on his sleeve. And it was awesome seeing... The England lads, when he was on TV, all behind him, just chanting Lions and Big Jim, it's coming home. So that was all on the TV. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I suppose that that's what sport is. You know, we're talking about it. We, we you know, spoke about the Euros, spoke about the romance of the Lions and stories like Marcus Smith is one of them that we all love to see. The big thing for him now is getting an opportunity. Personally, I hope Finn isn't as bad as it says. An Achilles tear, however minor, ain't Pretty great. Tough. Yeah. yeah, it's not not great. So I think watch this space. I, I can't see Finn staying. If that is the case, they'll keep him there because it's Finn Russell. But yeah, you, all credit goes to Marcus Smith, his teammates, Quinns, and I've said it again, Quinns, and obviously England as well. And in the other big news, Alan Wynn Jones is training again, so he might even be flying out. Mate, I mean, this bloke, I've spoken about him a lot on this podcast. Jim's bagged him a lot on this podcast. I think, Jim, when he popped his shoulder against Japan, you, you probably said his career was over pretty much, didn't you? 
Well, I'm Only like, because no, I know that he'd want, to he'd want to prove me wrong. So yeah. I'm almost like a motivator. So I've said that thinking he's listened to this. He wants to prove me wrong yet again. What's he done, Andrew? Mate, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Like it's come kind of out the blue. And I mean, I don't know whether I'll take my eye off the ball or, you know, it's just been kept under the radar that he's back training again. And then all of a sudden he's going to be flying out in a couple of days back to South Africa, hopefully, because it'll have a massive uplift for the, for the squad. But, mate, Lazarus, what a recovery. You, you know, you dislocate your shoulder, pop your shoulder, whatever it is. That's a good three months out for me or you, Jim, probably six. And he's just gone in three or four weeks. Now I'm fine. Bang, get me back on that plane. What a warrior. And it all comes down to the splits that he did in Ibiza on that video that we posted on social media. What a legend. And he sucked his finger, which not many men can do. Uh, <laughs> I could not pull that off, and he did. Uh, I've, I've just kept my shoulder. I've had shoulder issues all my career. I've had two shoulder reconstructions each side, which equals four. You know, so I'm thinking, was it this? I'm questioning him here. The medic in me is questioning. Did, he, he can't have dislocated it fully, is Don't what I'm saying. He must have like it must have just popped in or slipped or whatever because well it's Alan Wynn Jones he probably did it probably popped out through the skin and he's popped it back in and Stitched he's himself. back only positive by having him go out there I don't know how scared South Africa will be knowing that he was injured but I think the boost it will give the Lions squad uh, the management team do you know what I mean like Warren Gatland obviously a big fan of him he's a British and Irish Lion legend um, so it can only be positive my worry is though. It's if Eben Etzebeth is running at him with that big arm of his. One of them's a bit smaller now because he had a shoulder problem himself and it's still double the size of my leg. But it's nonetheless it's smaller than the other one. <laughs> but if he's running down his channel, is Alan Wynne Jones going to be able to put him into next week like Jim Hamilton from 2012? I don't know, is what I'm saying. But I hope it does happen. Yeah, it'd be great to see him out there. All well, away from South Africa and the Lions now. England, Thresh, Canvas, 714 at Twickenham. What would you make of that performance, Gertie? Some of the rugby that was on show was, was brilliant. There were mistakes, of course, there were. It's a team that's you know young and has not been together too much uh, and, and for too long. But, you know, there's some sprouts coming out of that team that, uh, you know, show that England rugby is in a hell of a good place. Uh, you know, Freddie Stewart at fullback, Marcus Smith, obviously, Harry Randall, uh, and I'm just talking about the backs really now, at nine, you know, have really shone in this jersey over the last couple of weeks, and especially against Canada. You know, I don't want to be horrible, and I said it about Canada last week, you know, they got humped by... Uh, a Wales change-up team as well, you know, and they've slipped right off the kind of radar from being, you know, quarter finalists in in a World Cup years and years and years ago. Um, so it was, I didn't expect seventy points, but you know, some of the boys and some of the youngsters that are banging form, you know, gelled together by a bit of experience. Henry Slade obviously went pretty well. Um, you know, it was it was a training run effectively at times, and and but you have to still be accurate to score seventy points. Joe Thock and a singer, absolute beast. Um, and it was great to see, you know, uh, we, we spoke about Marcus Smith earlier. Obviously, he you know, gets announced that he's on, on the on the tour to the Lions over in South Africa during the game. And, um, you know, the, the scenes afterwards were brilliant. So, um, yeah, a, a real positive for England rugby. Eddie Jones has now got a wide base of players to pick from and, um, you know, some real young talent as well. Not only for, you know, the next 6, 12, 18 months, but for you know, the next five, six, seven, eight years, there's a lot of young talent that's coming through. Uh, and it's going to be there for a while. So um, exciting times. Do you think quite a few of them will be one cat wonders or do you think we'll, we'll see more of most of them? Wait, oh, why oh, being, oh, Andy Rowe, why are you being horrible saying some of them are going to be one cat run, wonders, two cat wonders? It's just horrible, that is. They play for their country. Uh, but yeah, I think some of them will be. Um, I don't <laughs> for some boys, you know, they've definitely put their hand up. You know, you expect the likes of Marcus Smith, Harry Randall, they're going to be continuing involved now. Freddie Stewart as well, potentially. Um, you know, Cock and a Singer back in the mix, but there are going to be guys that, you know, that they're going to have to wait a long time uh, to get back in the mix again. Uh, but that's the nature of it, isn't it? You know, you want a competitive squad. As Jim said, that, you know, the future is rosy for England with, with all these youngsters coming through. But, you know, you, you get back to the, the autumn and Eddie's got everyone to pick from. You know, those Saracens boys are back in the Premiership. You know, there'll be injury issues from the Lions tour, etc. There's always that knock-on effect of a Lions tour. So we're going to see some change. Um, some of these boys may have to wait a few more years to get another opportunity. Um, some of them will be banging the mix for, for the autumn and moving forward towards the World Cup. And, yeah, that's the exciting thing. A lot of them have put their best foot forward. Um, you know, the, the likes that we've spoken about. Max Malins as well, I thought was great against the USA last week. 
Um, you know, you just want to see a squad evolve and, and these youngsters be given a chance. But some of them will ultimately, with the depth that we've got in England, um, you know, not be seen for a while again. But their challenge will be go back to their club, continue to improve and, 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 and show Eddie that they're ready whenever there are opportunities. What do you think Eddie has learned over these two games? That he's got a pool of young players that are gifted, that the USA and Canada are a long way away from where they need to be, um, if we're speaking frankly. I suppose it's been an easy two or three weeks for Eddie Jones, hasn't it? An easy four weeks that they've been in camp. And I bet he's probably really enjoyed it. You know, you've got a load of young lads who are receptive to coaching. Uh, I go back to what I've said a couple of times on the podcast today. They genuinely looked like they were loving life, didn't they? And I yeah. think that that brings it back to how high pressure rugby can be. And sometimes it's difficult to really, really enjoy it because of the high pressure games that you're in, the environments that you're in. But they were just loving life, weren't they? So I imagine he got some real enjoyment out of that. The big thing is going to be for England, like Goody's mentioned, they were poor in the Six Nations. Eddie Jones, let's go back to it, was, was being questioned uh, whether or not he was the right man, whether or not the players were the right players. It's almost like they've got a clean piece of paper now where he can draw up a squad. He can argue that he wants to bring youngsters in when the autumn tests come back around and they'll be properly challenged by the Southern Hemisphere teams. Uh, but yeah, as again, I just reiterate, there's some quality players to shoot from. I'd just like to see Eddie Jones. I know he said the premiership form doesn't matter. I want to see him pick on form. That's, but it's not, yeah. yeah. I'm more bothered about Scotland players because I'm more bothered about the Scotland team winning and doing well. But and I think if you're playing well in the Premier, you deserve to be picked. Simple as that. You can't have lads not playing well internationally and keep picking them because you like them. Like, I just don't think it works. But again, it's his prerogative. Um, you know, the Lions tour is obviously taking over the narrative, taking over everything at the minute. And he's probably quite happy, I reckon, to go into the radar and fly over in his bubble to Japan and coach and then fly back round to America and coach and then go see about the Barrett's family <laughs> on the way back through to England. What a lucky man. Well, we can have a chat now with a man who's taken his England opportunity with both hands over the past couple of weeks. Leicester and England fullback, Freddie Stewart, joins us. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. Not too bad, thank you. Just um, just got home after a trip back from London after the um, the football last night in camp. So, yeah, in good spirits. Well, until obviously England lost, but other than that, no, happy days. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the fight. Hey, Freddie, you've come a long way. Let's get it out there. I was watching you a couple of years ago when I was down at Leicester filming the documentary there. You were about 12 or 13 at the time. Um, you've come a long way, mate. How's it feel? Yeah, it's. Um, I think the whole, the whole last year, two years, really, has just been been a bit surreal um it's been a, a bit of a roller coaster um obviously i remember meeting you jim when you filmed the documentary i think that was two years ago now um where we won the academy league final from there onwards it's just been it's been pretty pretty mental so um yeah really just loved every minute of it and i um, just want to keep going i mean it's, it's a phenomenal rise isn't it obviously you've come into the leicester team and and you've not just come in and filled a shirt you've come in and absolutely dominated the fullback jersey um, with all the changes that have gone on the club over the last sort of few years you're this young lad coming through the academy and then bang straight into the first team and ripping it up um, just give us a, a bit of insight into what it's been like this year under Steve Borthwick the changes that have been made and you know you're playing with so much confidence in a team that has grown in confidence this year but has come from a pretty tough place doesn't it? Yeah absolutely I think um, since Steve's come in he's done a fantastic job um, and I think that's with, with both the rugby and the culture off the field as well. Um, and the boys are really bought into it. And, um, you know, when you train and, and play in an environment like that, it's, it brings the best out of everyone. Um, so I was was fortunate enough to get to get selected. And then from there on, it was just about trying to nail down that, that starting jersey and play as, as well as I could. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw Eddie Jones was at the one of the last games that you lads played. It might have been against Montpellier in the final, actually. Um, he was sat there on his phone, probably listening to the podcast as well at the same time, just wondering <laughs> who he should pick. But <laughs> like, how's it all come about? I mean, there is obviously a void in the in the fifteen shirt uh, for England. A lot of people have spoken about it. Not too sure who's going to fill that position. You have been stand out for Leicester. You're a young lad coming through the system. You're a big lad under the high ball, all these kind of core skills that you need, or I think you need. I'm just watching it. I sound like I know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> how's it how, how's it come around for you? Because Eddie was obviously there at the back end of the season. We knew that there'd be some younger lads coming into the fold. How were your conversations in the lead-up to that? Was it kind of you knew there was an opportunity or did it come as a bit of a shock? Um, well, the summer the summer tour was always something I wanted to target, um, especially when I started 
you know, playing at, playing at 15 a bit in the season and, and, and getting picked by Steve, you know, that was then the, the focus and looking at that England stuff. Um, and there wasn't really much, much contact. Um, didn't really hear anything, just, just wanted to, to, to try and, you know, let the, let the rugby do the talking. And then um, fortunately enough, got, got the call. And um, from, from there on, it was, was into camp. So um, it was a bit of a surprise, actually. Um, it, it was definitely something I targeted, but um, it, it did come as a bit of a surprise when, when the call came. And how was the camp before the games? Obviously, I mean, we'll get onto the games in a minute because you've you've starred over the last two weeks. But the camps must have been pretty tough as well, getting to know a lot of boys from different clubs. It's not, you know, it was a new team pretty much thrown together by Eddie Jones and picked a lot of youngsters on form, and rightly so. Um, dealing with the kind of COVID bubbles as well, has that been a, an added challenge? We've seen all the issues in South Africa with the Lions, but for you guys, young lads bonding, you want to be mixing together. Is it was it tough, or was there a lot, a lot of stuff that you could do and get to know each other that way? Um, I think, to be fair, credit to the lads. I think a lot of us came in and it was our first camp. So I think everyone was sort of in the same boat, which was quite nice. Um, and everyone came with an open mind. It was great to meet all the other lads. Um, we had plenty of social space and um, played lots of pool throughout the week. Um, lovely time meeting the lads. Um, made some great connections over that four weeks. And it feels genuinely feels like we've been in there for a couple of months. I'm amazed it's only been four weeks. It's, um, it felt like an age. Um, but the lads have all bonded really well. We, you know, we did some good activity, team activities, and um, stuck in our bubble, and it was happy days. And Freddie, I'm trying to look back on your career. Obviously, it's been a year, 18 months, two years, how long we've been in this kind of process. Obviously, at the weekend, there was fans in the stadium, your family. Have your family seen you play professional rugby much or not? Um, no, they actually haven't, so... I think I played, must have played five or six games before the COVID stuff really kicked off. So they must have seen one or two or three games, but not really any proper stuff. So um, I think the first game we had fans back in was actually the final at Twickenham. Um, I'm a granddad who's not seen me play professional before. He's, he's always wanted to see me play. And he actually got to come watch the England game as well. So that was a really special moment to have him there. Um, yeah, the folks as well. So it was actually, yeah, quite an emotional day. And I can imagine you're singing the anthem as well. He's, you know, it's very special the first time you do it, for any time you do it, actually, for, for England. Um, do you manage to pick your family out in, in the crowd as well? Do you know where they're sitting? Did they want countless amount of tickets because they hadn't seen you play? And, and that's the one thing. You get to international rugby, you get a ticket allocation. You probably get 400 people wanting tickets, but you only get about 10, don't you? So uh, how hard was that to decipher who could get one and who couldn't? The Norfolk, the Norfolk Roots are strong. So I had a lot of people here who wanted to come up and watch. So um, heavy in demand. But no, I, I picked the family out in the warm-up. I always liked to find mum and dad. Um, and they were there with granddad opposite the anthem, which was perfect, banging the eye line. Um, I think I had to look away for a little bit because I was getting slightly emotional, but um, it was really special to have them there, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you look at the two games, Freddie, as well, no disrespect to the opposition. It's probably, um, whether or not you lads believe it or not, maybe it's because I made my debut for Scotland against Romania. I don't know if you saw it. Um, <laughs> but um, do you know what I mean? It's a kind of easing your way into international rugby is what I'm trying to say. So you know you're going to get some touches of the ball. You know it's not going to be a real high-pressure environment and... Not that we've seen many horror stories out there of lads being picked on the biggest stage and it not going well, but I think it's quite nice for some of you young lads to get a taste for it on the front foot, getting the ball in hand. Like, how was it? How was it playing for you? Because a lot of people watch this or listen to it and be like, yeah. a young lad, you know, 20 years old or, or, or whatever you are, it's a young age to, to be making a debut. And they'll be like, what's it like? What was it like playing for England? I think the best bit was was getting to the stadium really and that whole experience of getting off the bus and, and you know taking it all in because I've only been to Twickenham once before so that was um, I needed a couple of minutes just to be like right I'm here I'm I'm about to play for England you know it was a bit 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 surreal um, and then to be honest mate in the game once once the the first whistle went it it, was, it went by like a flash um, I think once that that whistle goes you're sort of so absorbed in the rugby in the game you sort of forget about the occasion and you forget about the situation. Um, which I think is good because it, it sort of keeps that distraction away. And then obviously it um, had some really, really great, like in the game and stuff, some great front football. Like you play with the likes of Harry Randall, Marcus Smith. It's, it's you know, they make it so easy for everyone else. Um, so it's great to experience, you know, play with new players and, and getting over line with the wins. And one of the things, uh, when I was at Leicester, a lot of the Leicester lads would go into England camp and I don't know whether it's still the same. But a lot of the Leicester lads would hang out together and they wouldn't really mingle with the other boys. Um, you've gone into an England camp that's fresh, that's new. Eddie Jones is there. I know he likes to break up little cliques and likes everyone to mingle. Um, were you, any, any of the lads from other clubs that you got on with, especially more so than 
perhaps just hanging out with the Leicester boys? Yeah, the, the Newcastle lads are probably the lads um, I socialise with the most, especially Adam Radwan. He's a bit of a bit of a practical joker. Um, quickest bloke I've ever seen. Genuinely, that man is is lightning. Um, I'm not looking forward to coming up against him this season. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, he's, he's, a t- he's a top lad. Um, there's some good lads there. And then, and then Mitch as well from Saints, he's a top lad and Ferb. So, yeah, there was loads of socialising. I think Eddie made it very clear from the start, you know, not to go in and, and just sit with our, our team members and stuff. Um, so I think the boys all bought in and, and socialised. So I made loads of, loads of new mates. I've got a new mate as well. I've been texting Adam Radwan today. He's on the train back up to Newcastle. So we were going to get you both on, Freddie, and he said he couldn't. I says, well, let's have a FaceTime tomorrow. You can meet the kids and we can just talk about how good it is being quick. So, no, he was class. I think yeah. one thing that I really enjoyed watching around it, and I, there was a few moments, but more the headline moment was when, obviously, Marcus Smith got called up for the Lions. He's being interviewed at the end, and you lads all behind him cheering. It seems like there's a real young nucleus a group of players that are just loving being there. Do you know what I mean? Because I think you look at the England team and you yeah. don't need to answer this, me and Goody have spoken about it. It's always been a bit stale, right? And whatever's gone is gone and it's all about the future. There's a, and It seems like in a short space of time, everyone's got so tight, whether or not that's the Euros or whatever, but everyone just seems so happy for Marcus Smith. Like, how would he have dealt with that? Is he quite a humble guy? Is he, um, does he like, like to take the lead? I mean, is he one of the lads? What, how was all that happening? Yeah, so Marcus is a top guy. And I think that that what happened at the end there is just testament to how how close and you know how how much of a unit we were by the end of that four weeks because it's it's not a long time, um, but because we're sort of with each other twenty four seven, you just develop those relationships so much so much quicker. Um, and Marcus is he's, he's a true professional. Right? He's a he, he's a good lad. He knows when to joke around. He knows when he's when he's switched on, um, and he's a leader. So. Like for him to get to get called up to the Lions, we didn't find out till till after the final whistle. And I think, yeah, like when when we all went over to clap him and cheer for him, that just shows how much it, it not only meant to him but to all of us as well to see that. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, you know the way he's played over the last two weeks uh, and prior to that certainly helped, and, and you boys have helped him along the way as well with the performance against USA last week in his first test. Um, tell us about after the game then, because obviously you know it's difficult with the situation we're in now to, to celebrate. You wouldn't have had too much celebrating to do after the USA game because obviously there was a Canada game this week and it was a short turnaround. Yeah. Did the boys manage to have a few beers together? Did you watch the football together? Was it a decent time by the result? Yes, yeah, we um, we got a we got a pub booked out in London, so the boys were all down there last night watching the football together, which was a, which was good fun. Obviously, until until the penalty shootout, but um, yeah, we managed to. It, we we struggled obviously after the USA game because we're in our COVID bubble and stuff. There's not really that much we can get up to. Um, so I think it was nice for the lads, obviously, with the off-season now, just to have a, a big blowout um, down there. So that was good fun. Just a shame uh, England couldn't get over the line. And first cap initiations, we used to have to sing a song on the bus on the way back. Is there anything that you had to do for your first cap? I did. I had to sing a song and I sang Southgate, You're the One. Kept yes. Very, uh, winner. Well, he, he, he is. Yesterday, but... Exactly. Exactly. And the reason no, I wear this cap, Goody, is because I don't know oh, see, but yeah, look at that. How terrible was that? What's that what is there? it? Well, in the in the camp I had a bet with Gabs. We were a weird one actually. We were doing some axe throwing. It was just like a team team activity. And he'd stuck three in the balls on. I said, There's no way you're getting a fourth in there. There was about a, a space that tight. And I said, if you do it, I'll go I'll buzz cut, go block on. Then he's managed to somehow squeeze it in. Um ah, So I, no. I made sure I waited till after the um after the games. Um because I don't want to go out there and embarrass myself. But yeah, unfortunately, um my girlfriend's not Phil, too pleased. And, um, Phil Foden, but a bit shorter. Yeah, it is terrible. Um, it, it needs to grow out. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. Uh, best of luck. Uh, hopefully we see you in that England shirt again. Plenty more times, I'm sure. You're only 20. You've got plenty, plenty more years ahead of you. Yeah. And uh, enjoy your beta. Will do. Thanks, lad. Cheers, Cheers Freddie. Top lad. top lad. Yeah, top lad. Apart from his live now. I mean, fair play, though. I've seen a lot of people have a bet like that in camp lose a bet and then not follow through with it. So he's picked his head and he's dyed what is left blonde. But park all that, he's obviously a good lad for sticking to a bet, but what a player, eh? Coming through the academy, maybe it was you that sent him on his way, Jim, doing that documentary at the Leicester Tigers Academy a couple of years ago. Maybe he just looked at it to you as a legend and just thought, well, I'm going to dominate the 15 jersey for Leicester and then I'm going to play for England. And what a big unit he is as well. I did shoehorn him, not that I'm anyone to do that. I'm not an agent or anything remotely resembling trying to pick out 
talent, but him and George Martin were two of the players yeah. uh, that I picked out. I was like, these lads <laughs> go all the way. And <laughs> I was right. Again, not that's got anything to do with me. Fair play. You know what? I did like the profile of that England team. No disrespect to the US and Canada. Um, but you, I've always said it. I'll say it again. English rugby, the future is bright because you've got guys of that quality, Marcus Smith, Harry Randall, Radwan the old wheels, you know, Joe Thock and a singer who's still about 13, 14 years old and walking through tackles like Jonah Loma, you don't want to compare players, but he's got that. So I think from an England backline perspective, my goodness me, they're going to be good. And Ireland hammered the USA in Dublin. Did we learn much from that one? No, I mean, Ireland, we, we know they've got, it was kind of like a, I don't want to be horrible. It's like a Pro 14 game, wasn't it, for for some of the Irish provinces, you know, Leinster especially, who it just comes so easy to them. The, the opposition and, and, you know, let's not forget, USA haven't played since the World Cup either, have they? Um, you know, obviously they played England the week before, but they've not been in camp. They've not been able to grow as, as a team. Um, you know, obviously the MLR is going on over there, but it, it's been so difficult for these international teams, especially the Tier 2 nations, to actually have a competition since the World Cup. They haven't. Uh, and with that, they've got no cohesiveness. They're, they're not gelling as a team. You, you've got players playing all over the place that you're trying to drag into a squad. And it's tough on those two nations, Canada and USA, who have come over here and had their pants pulled down. Let's not make you know, too many excuses for it, but it's, it has been tough in terms of what's happened COVID-wise for them over the last two years. Now, um, these island boys have been in their provinces that there's so much talent in, in Ireland at the minute as we see in the Pro 14 that we, we kind of knew that was going to happen um, you know and they've been improving steadily under Mike Cat and, and, and Andy Farrell and obviously Faz is going to go over to the Lions Tour now as, as we know and coach and be part of that setup for the Test Series so right, have we learned much about Ireland did we expect that result no we haven't learned much because we know the, the qualities are there already um, and did we expect those results? Yeah, we did because A, the state of the other two nations, but B, the talent that is in Ireland. And, and again, it's similar to the England thing, isn't it? The pool of players that they have got in certain positions is very, very strong. And there is that um, kind of the treadmill of players, not treadmill, what's the word I'm after? Conveyor belt. There is that conveyor belt of players coming through there and their youth system over there is producing quality. So, um yeah, the, the future is, is is rosy for England and for Ireland as well. And, and you know, looking forward to seeing how these players get opportunities further down the line once we get to the Six Nations next year, because that is the next big competition, isn't it? One thing I would like to say, because I don't want to bag the USA and Canada, I know the, the coaches and some of the players that are involved in their setups there, and it's easy to turn around and say, well, they're not good enough. They need exposure to high-pressure games, don't they? You look at Fiji, probably being the headline one, and how they played against the All Blacks at the weekend. We saw Tonga get 100 points bottom in with their second slash third team. In order for rugby to evolve and improve, there needs to be a constant for the USA and Canada and Fiji and Tonga and Samoa and Japan. You know, Argentina, we saw them in the championship, didn't we, when they were playing against New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. They got better. Of course they did, because you have to in these high-pressure games. It's a huge ask to ask the USA and Canada to come over and rock up and play against players that have been playing at such a high level in the Pro 14, in the Prem, regardless if they're the young lads or the second string England team or Ireland team. It's a big ask. And this all comes round about the global calendar and about trying to get everything in line in terms of the tier one and tier two and how that looks. But look, at the minute, it's bloody secondary, isn't it? You know, all I'm thinking about is IB for the minute. I'll be completely honest with you. And how I get <laughs> to Mallorca and get my biscuit on top of my head, frazzled to fry some eggs on there for the kids to then put them in the kids' club. That's all I'm thinking at the minute. But rugby's on, sun's out, guns out and all that. Well, the opposition was much tougher for Wales and they drew 20 all with Argentina despite playing against 14 men for most of the match. And they face each other again this weekend. Do you think Wales, do you think they'll be better off for having faced the Pumas as opposed to England and Ireland facing weaker opposition? I mean, it's a proper test, isn't it? You know, let's not forget Wales put 60-odd on Canada last week. Um, but yeah, you, you know, it, Argentina again, it's been tough for them. They went, I know they went over to Australia. They beat the All Blacks as well. Um, don't forget that one, Andy Rowe. Um, but again, for, for for these players that are coming over now, how much competition have these Argentina boys played in? Uh, but they are a strong nation. It's a proper test for Wales. I think Pivac and Stephen Jones and those boys will be 
quite enjoying the, the, the stiffer test than what Canada was last week because you've then got a real good feeling. It's, yeah, it's great putting 60 points on a team, but when you win or compete in a proper test match with a lot of your superstars missing, which Wales are, um, you know, and they drew 20 all at the weekend and, you know, ultimately they, they probably should have won because it was a red card, um, you know, 50 minutes into the game, which was me old head on head again, Jim, as a tackle, just flying in. And people again are saying, oh, it wasn't a red. It's a clear red all day long, that is. But I think the Welsh will be happy that they're blooding some younger players, uh, giving them experience, but also, you know, a proper test against a, you know, a, a tier one nation in Argentina that are, you know, starting to become big boys of world rugby again. No one beats the All Blacks that often, do they? And, and uh, you know, Argentina beat them for the first time not so long ago. So it is a proper test match. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Producer Tim. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well and head on over to Spotify and we'll see you there. Rugby spot. Spotted pod, 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 pod.